at Plotly, I am the VP of product. That means uh, I look after the graphing libraries. I'm the original author of Plotly Express, and I help out with Dash. Uh, and I do some uh, outreach, like, uh, like this class, by like talking about what we do. Um, and in the interest of finding out a little bit about, uh, about the, the people I'm, I'm talking to today, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Zoom controls. You can sort of say yes or no um, in, the, uh, in the participant room, or you can just sort of say yes or no. Uh, who here uh, is, is comfortable with programming? Everyone here is comfortable with programming? All right. One person, 100% of respondents. <laughs> um, does, uh, does everyone here program in Python? JavaScript? Yes, yes, okay, here people are chatting. All right, who here prefers JavaScript to Python? One, all right. <laughs> uh, great, so um, Plotly, uh, at Plotly we basically create um, data visualization tools for programmers, primarily in Python and R. Uh, and so most of the developers at Plotly, like myself, we're familiar with JavaScript, we do a lot of JavaScript, uh, and our job is basically to shield our customers and our users from uh, having to do a lot of JavaScript. So we build Python and R tools uh, that sort of hide and encapsulate uh, JavaScript so that our, our customers and users don't have to use it. The first tool that I would like to tell you about today is called Plotly Express. Um, it's a Python library. You can download it today. It's MIT, MIT licensed. Um, and its main goal is to enable uh, rapid iteration on a single chart. So Plotly, with Plotly Express, you can express yourself quickly um, in terms of what kind of chart you want to make. You can play with a bunch of different views of data. And Plotly Express will take you all the way from data exploration to publication, if that's what you're doing. So if you want to embed a chart uh, in a journal article, put it on a website, uh, build it as part of an app, Plotly Express will handle that whole range. So without further ado, let me kind of dive in and give you a, a taste of what it's like to work with Plotly Express. So the environment that you should be seeing on my screen here is Jupyter Lab. How many people here are familiar with Jupyter Lab? Uh, mix. Okay, so Jupyter Lab um, is a uh, Python programming environment. Although it's not uh, only related, only restricted to Python. So Jupyter stands for Julia, Python, and R. Um, and I'm going to use it here uh, in Python mode. Um, it's a typical notebook-based environment. So you get these cells. I can type some Python code. I hit Shift Enter, and it executes. So let's get to it. Hide this here. So to start working with Plotly Express, you import it. It's a single import. And it's got some built-in data sets. And so I'm going to show you one of those data sets today. It's called Gapminder, after the organization that maintains it. Um, and it's basically got a few columns here. So I've got a column for a country. Each row here is a country in a year. Uh, so I've got the country, the continent, the year, the life expectancy for that country in that year, the population, the GDP per capita, and uh, the three-letter ISO code for that country. Can everybody see my screen? Is it a little small for the, for the font size? Should I make it bigger? No, okay, great. Uh, so for the purposes of data exploration, I'm actually going to, to restrict myself just to the year 2007. So, and this makes this pretty easy. There we go. So here, I've just got data for 2007. So let's get, let's get going with a little bit of data exploration uh, using Plotly Express. Let's take a look at variable of interest, say life expectancy. Put that on the x-axis. And here we go. I have a histogram uh, of life, ex life, life expectancy. Uh, you know, generally positive, a lot, of, uh, a lot of high numbers. Unfortunately, we've got one country here with a life expectancy between 35 and 40 years old. It's a little bit depressing. Um, uh, as you can see, the, 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 fig the figure here is fully interactive, so I can kind of hover over various things, I can zoom, I can double click to zoom back out. Let's see what we can find out about the one country that's in here. So one of the nice things about Plotly Express is let's do this kind of thing. We can say marginal equals rug. And all of a sudden I've got here um, one little mark for each of my countries. And so I can zoom in here, yeah, there's my one, my one country uh, with a life expectancy of 39 years in 2007. Uh, and if I, if I say that the hover name property is going to be the country name, I can see that this country is Swaziland. So already you're starting to see 
uh, what we can do with a little bit of, of data exploration uh, with Plotly Express with interactive visualization. So you can make this kind of plot in a number of, uh, of programming libraries, but you, if you want to find out what this country is, frequently you have to kind of go back to the data and do a subset. With interactive data visualization, you can use, you can sort of switch back and forth between the keyboard and the mouse uh, to, to get the insights that you're looking for. So let's keep, uh, keep exploring this a little bit. Let me use a bit more of my screen here. Yes. Um, so let's see if we can kind of understand the distribution of life expectancy. What's driving life expectancy? Let's color this by comma. So again, essentially the same histogram, but now it's been broken up by country. So now, you know, it's this exact same shape, but every little, uh, every little country now con contributes uh, a colored element of the appropriate, uh, of the appropriate color. And I've got my rug plot here has also been um, been disaggregated. So what you can see that I'm doing as I type is I'm basically mapping uh, columns of my data frame to visual variables. So here I've mapped uh, life expectancy to the x-axis and I've mapped the continent to the, to the color. Okay, uh, one of the things about a histogram though is that the, the level of granularity is, is a unit. So here you know, Swaziland takes up as much space as China on my, on my chart, or as India, which clearly is not very, not very comparable. So let's map the y-axis to population. And immediately now, you know, we're, we're starting to get a chart that's more proportional to, to population. Each person on Earth in 2007 co contributes the same pixel height here. Uh, and so, you know, we've got two, two big bumps here, one uh, in Asia, and, and uh, pretty clearly we can find here, boom, India, and then one of these will be China. Uh, there's China. Um, so this is how we map, you know, the, the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, a slightly different view of the data that'll allow us to see each individual country uh, in a different way than just as a dot on a rug plot is to turn this into a, um, sorry, is to, is to map, uh, let's map continent over to the, to the x-axis here first. Uh, rug plot. So now uh, I can see essentially, you know, the, the population distribution um, by, by continent. And I've kind of lost the rug plot. I've lost the, each individual country and uh, I've lost the, the life expectancy. So let's go from a histogram to a bar chart. All right, so now I can see that I've gotten back access to all of the individual countries. I can see the population. And now I'm sort of double encoding, right? I've got color and X are both, I'm uh, sorry, uh, yeah, color and X are both mapped to continent. So I can reuse one of these variables, say color, and remap it to life expectancy. So this is essentially the same chart as I had before, right? I used to have a histogram with the X axis was life expectancy, the color was continent, uh, the height was population, and the sort of individual access was through the little rug plot at the top. Now I've got the same thing, uh, except each little piece of the bar, each little bar here is, is, um, is interactive. So, so far so good. You're getting a sense of kind of what it's like to, uh, to iterate through different chart types using Plotly Express. Every chart that I've made so far is one line of Python, which is pretty nice. Now I'm you know, sort of iterating over it, but, but uh, it's, it's just sort of one line of Python. So let's keep going. If I look at this chart, I, I can kind of have a, a sort of part to whole relationship, right? Each, each little, little vertical chunk here represents one person essentially as part of a bar. Um, so there are other ways to represent part to whole relationships other than um, uh, as bar charts. Popular way of doing that would be a sunburst chart. So Plotly Express makes that pretty easy. Let's say a sunburst. Um, sunburst, you need to represent a hierarchy. So my hierarchy here is going to be continent and country. Uh, uh, there's no y-axis in, uh, in a sunburst, so I'll map this to uh, pop to values, keep everything else, uh, life expectancy, here we go. So this is a sunburst chart, same data, same rough approach, except this time, you know, instead of mapping things to X and Y, I'm essentially mapping the hierarchy directly. So I'm saying that I want uh, the, at the inside of my hierarchy, I want the continent and then country around the edges, still colored by life expectancy. Uh, one of the nice things about a sunburst, especially when it's interactive, is you can, you can drill. So here I'm just looking at Asia. Now I'm looking at everything. Now I'm looking sort of just at Africa. Um, and so once again, I'm showing how I can move from my keyboard to my mouse to get the, the visualization that I want to see. Um, 
you know, another way to do this was I could have subsetted my data in Python here to just focus on Africa and regenerated the, the plot, but you know, I can switch over to my mouse and do that a little bit more interactively. Um, one of the things that I like about the sunburst is that it places sort of, sort of, you know, conceptually similar countries next to each other, or at least geographically similar countries next to each other. So here you can see that, you know, India and China dominate. India has slightly lower life expectancy than China. You can see that from the color or you can see that from the hover. Um, and then generally, you know, given how, how much they dominate the population of Asia, the color for the Asian continent, which here is, is proportionally mapped, sort of halfway between the two. But you can see that Japan is much higher than the average for Asia, just based on the color contrast. And then similarly, you can see that Africa has the lowest uh, average life expectancy. And within Africa, you know, Egypt is doing okay, they're doing comparatively well, and Nigeria is doing comparatively poorly. And you can also spot some outliers. So here we've got Afghanistan is by far uh, the lowest life expectancy uh, in Asia. So sunburst, not too bad. Uh, a, a very similar way of looking at this data, if I kind of turn it inside out and make it rectilinear, is to use a tree map. So now this is essentially the same data, except instead of putting it radially as like a set of nested pie charts, I've now put boxes one inside the other. Um, the area of, the, of the, the box is still proportional to population and the color is still essentially uh, weighted life expectancy by population. You know, tree map sounds a lot like map. Can we make a map? Sure, we can make a map. If we turn this into a choropleth, now we no longer need a, a path, but we need uh, a location. So um, Plotly Express comes with a world map built in. Um, if I map ISO alpha to the locations um, and color by population. Oh, no, I don't want to color by population. I'm already coloring my life expectancy. So here now I have a map. Um, again, it's still the same data. I'm still just slicing and dicing. I can still mouse over. Um, and I've still got, you know, my hover name is here. Uh, if this isn't quite enough information and I want more information about each country, I can actually add extra data. So I can say hover data equals, and then here I'm going to add all of the columns of my data frame. Um, so my, my image is a little bit more complex now, but I've got every piece of data from each row of the, of the data frame is now available in the hub. Okay, so you know I've been looking at population, I've been looking at life expectancy. Um, and maybe through this data exploration, I've now developed sort of, oh, sorry, there's a question. What is the projection here? Uh, the projection here is an equal rectangular projection. Although I'm glad you asked, you can, uh, you can change that if you like and say projection equals natural earth. I always forget the problem. Uh, so there's a bunch of projections built in. I think there's 27 of them. Um, and the default is equal rectangular. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, so, so far, you know, I've been, I've been essentially kind of iterating through a bunch of different ways of looking at the same data. Uh, what if I have a sort of hypothesis? I want to sort of see whether two pieces of data are correlated to each other. So just looking at this map, perhaps low income countries have a lower life expectancy. Not the most transcendent uh, insight, but uh, let's let's take a look if we can see that. So one way to, to check for that would be to, to make a scatter plot. Um, let's map uh, x to GDP per capita uh, and y to our friend life expectancy. Leave the hover name, leave the hover data. I'm already mapping this. There's no projection. All right. So we can see that you know, there's generally a monotonic uh, correlation between GDP per capita and life expectancy. It's not linear. Standard thing we do when we have a nonlinear relationship is we sort of do a log transform to see if maybe that straightens things out a little bit. Um, I've lost access to the continent, to the population, but I can get it back. So one uh, variable I can map here is the size of the marker. I can say size equals pop. Okay, so the, some of the markers are a little small. Let's scale them up, size max, 65. Okay, and then uh, let's color by content. With the trailing color. So how many, how many people have seen this plot before? So this, this, is a, this plot was essentially made by uh, Hans Rosling of the, the Gapminder um, organization to sort of try and explain uh, the relationship between GDP per capita and life expectancy. Um, 
and, uh, and Hans Rosling did a, a very famous TED talk where he sort of animates this and gestures at the screen. Um, and in fact, it's actually reasonably easy to, to make that, that, uh, that kind of animation with Plotly Express because um, you know, there's, there's one dimension here which I've pinned to 2007, but what if I want to use the year dimension? Um, so if I reset my data, data frame to contain every year, and I replot here, now every country will show up once um, as, a, as a separate bubble. Um, but just like I'm mapping life expectancy to Y, GDP per cap to X, color to continent, I can map the year to the animation frame. So let's go ahead and do that. Animation frame equals year. So there's a couple extra things I need to do here. I have to say animation group equals country so that uh, Plotly Express knows that uh, corresponding data for a given country should transition. Uh, and unfortunately, Plotly Express is not really smart enough to, to compute uh, the y-axis, so I gotta give it a range y here to, um, to keep things steady as I animate. It's a little bit longer, but now I've got this slider control here. I can hit play. Hopefully this is coming through in, uh, in living color here with, uh, with Zoom, but the, uh, the plots are animated, so you can sort of see the evolution of life expectancy and GDP per capita uh, in an animated way. So you know, animation isn't really for everyone. There are other ways to show um, to show dimensions. You know, once you've once you've occupied x and y in size and color, uh, other than making things move. One uh, popular way of doing that is to uh, put things into small multiples. So here I'm going to say facet call equals year, and to keep things from getting out of control, I'm going to wrap it. At and so now, instead of actually animating the frames, I've just shown you the frames uh, side by side. And uh, in this view, you know, if I zoom in on one area, they're coordinated. If I pan on one area, they're coordinated. If I double click, they reset. Uh, one thing which I haven't shown about the interaction uh, with, within Plotly Express is uh, you can interact with the legend. So you can click uh, on a continent here to hide it, click to bring it back, double click to isolate just that continent, double, double click to bring everything back. Um, so that's basically a little bit of a tour of what you can do uh, within Plotly Express. You can map variables uh, in your data to visual variables in your, in your output. You can do a fair bit with just, um, just one, uh, I'm not going to say line of Python, because this is clearly spanning a number of lines, but uh, one statement of Python, uh, just by sort of editing things uh, interactively to kind of you know, work your way through the, the, the design space of possible visualizations for a given data set. So Plotly Express isn't limited to just this kind of, uh, of data exploration. Let's say you know, you've landed on a chart that you like. So I'm going to set this back to uh, a single view. You've landed on a chart that you like. Um, now, you know, maybe you'd like to customize it a little bit to be able to put it in a, uh, a journal article or on a website or something like this. So your data set here, uh, you know, I'm using the uh, GDP per cap here. It's kind of a strange way of saying GDP per capita. It's kind of got weird casing. Uh, maybe you don't like the default plotly colors. That's fine. Uh, so how do you customize this sort of thing? Uh, the default plotly colors come with come built in with something called a template. We have a number of others. So let's say you're feeling a little bit dark. You can use plotly dark. Let's say you're feeling a little bit more, uh, more standard. You can say simple white. Uh, this is kind of a, a more classic presentation. Um, of course, you can give this a title. So like binder chart. Um, and you can override the labels. So you can say labels and polls, and then here, uh, GDP per cap is going to be GDP per capita. All right, let's scroll down a little bit. GDP per capita. Uh, while we're at it, we can say life expectancy. Uh, and you can do stuff like um, uh, customize the, the tick labels and, and various other things. So I'll just show one way of doing that. You can update the x-axis here uh, and set the tick prefix equals dollar. And so now I've got a little dollar sign next to my, uh, my x-axis here. And this is mirrored through uh, in the, oh no, it's not mirrored through today, okay. Uh, it's usually mirrored through into the hover label. I'll have to look into why that is. Um, but you can uh, you can customize any aspect uh, of this chart just by uh, 
some built-in arguments within Plotly Express or by updating the figure that's coming in uh, and, tra and transforming uh, the underlying representation. Questions so far about data exploration and customizing charts in Plotly Express before I move on to the second half? All right. If anything comes to mind, there'll be there'll be time a little bit later. So, so far, you know, I've I've, I've sort of shown Plotly Express. I've iterated through a bunch of things. I've, I've shown that you can kind of customize. One thing I forgot to mention is that you can export this chart in a variety of formats: SVG, PNG, PDF. Uh, you can embed it into a website, and it remains interactive if you like. But everything that Plotly Express will do essentially makes a single visualization. Uh, I'm either making a single chart or a set of small multiples or a single animation or something like this. And this is fine. It's a very important thing. Um, but at Plotly, most of our users were telling us after a number of years of, of building libraries like Plotly Express um, that it, it wasn't quite enough. Uh, they were more interested in building richer presentations that had multiple very different kinds of charts. They wanted to have charts that were able to interact with each other. Um, and they still wanted to do this in Python. They still didn't want to write any JavaScript. So um, we, we went ahead and built Dash. Let me tell you a little bit about Dash. Oh, I skipped a slide here. So this is a, a little gallery, a little moving gallery, hopefully it's coming through on, zo on Zoom, of all the different kinds of charts that you can make with Plotly Express. So I mostly just showed you bars and scatters and histograms, but you can make polar charts, you can make fancier maps, you can put lines on maps, uh, you can make scatter plot matrices, you can put regression lines, you can do parallel coordinates. So Plotly Express is definitely worth sort of a longer look. Um, if, uh, if, if Python is your bag. Um, but moving on to Dash. So Dash uh, is essentially what we built when we, when we started listening to our users who were telling us they wanted to go beyond making a single visualization at a time. Um, and what Dash allows you to build are what, what we call analytical applications. And I'll define that in a second. Um, the, the, the core promise of Dash is that you can build analytical applications with no JavaScript required. So this is something I've been saying you know, throughout my, my little talk here. Um, you can write Dash apps in either pure R or pure Python. Um, and Dash itself is open sourced and MIT licensed. Um, so let me give you a little flavor of what it's like to, to build a Dash application. And that'll show you what an analytical application is to us. Uh, and then I'll close with some examples uh, and a little bit of an explanation of how at Plotly uh, we, we, this is how this is part of our business. So uh, we recently released uh, a way to work with Dash applications from within JupyterLab. Uh, so I'm kind of looking forward to demoing this for the first time uh, today. Um, so I'm going to close this notebook. I'll fire up a new one. And to save you from having to watch me type an entire Dash application, I've, I've, uh, I've preloaded sort of a few intermediate steps and I'll be copy pasting from this notebook. Uh, so I've got here a little file called steps. Um, and here I go. So here is a very simple uh, Dash application in Python. It's just a few lines. Um, so there's a few imports. This is the, new, uh, the new, newly released Jupyter Dash module. So to define a Dash application, you just create an app and you give it what's called a layout and then you run the app. All right, let's see what that does. So what it does is it opens up a new window and this is the fancy part about the Jupyter Dash interaction. Everybody can see the two, the two panes. All right, so this is the, the app code and then this is the output. So here I basically said that I've got a layout for my app and it's an HTML div with two children and a level one header that says demo and a level two header that says I'm a subheader. Nice starting point for an app. I've just made a website. Great. Um, run server mode JupyterLab basically says that it's, uh, it, you know, it's sort of being hosted locally here. Uh, it's also live updating, so you can't see my, you can't see my hands. But if I just type, I'm a subheader. Yes, I am. And all I do is re-execute. Uh, automatically, the app refreshes on the side, so as to you know, maximize uh, the developer velocity here. Um, so I promised that there would be graphs, and I promised that they would be interactive, and that they would interact with each other. Let's, uh, let's get to that. Um, the way that we define interaction within, within Dash is that we have these, uh, these components here, headers, um, and you can, you can define a whole bunch of different kinds of components, and you can define the interactions between them in pure Python. So step two of my app, looks like this. So the changes that I've made here is I've imported a new, a new module called core components and a new module called dependencies. My layout has changed a little bit. Uh, as you can see here, I've got my header and I've also got this little square. Um, and so here I have 
Uh, I've got my H1 demo, and then my H2 uh, is the output, but it doesn't seem to appear. And then I've got my input, so dcc.input, uh, which is this little text box here. And here I have uh, what's called a callback. And so my callback maps um, the value of my input to the children of my output. So my output here is H2, and my input is a, a text box field. And then the mapping here is, is pretty trivial. It's the identity mapping. So the value of chil the children of the output are going to be the value of the input. So if I type hello, it types hello. Um, so what's happening here is that every time I hit a keystroke, uh, there is an HTTP call that's happening to a Python backend, and the, this piece of Python code here is running. Uh, and then the answer is um, sort of merged back into the output of my application here. So every, every keystroke here um, is a, a Python function that gets run. And Dash handles all of this for you, the JavaScript, the front end, the back end, uh, so that mostly you have to just write this Python code. So this is pretty trivial. I've got some text input, text output. Let's, uh, let's make a slightly richer application. So step three. All right, so now I've got, this, is, this here is a dropdown. I can choose a year. And you can see that as I choose a year, my, uh, my graph is updating in response to the year. So this is essentially the same graph as I was making before. So what has changed in my app to make this possible? So for one thing, I'm now importing Plotly Express. Um, and I, I'm loading up the Gapminder data set. Um, I'm computing what I call the column options here. So I'm basically grabbing the unique values of the year. And then here, instead of um, a header and an input, I've got a dropdown and a graph. So my dropdown is called year. And the default value is 2007. And then the options for this dropdown are the unique values uh, of the year column. Uh, of the data frame. Um, and this is my callback now. So my callback basically says that the figure of my graph depends on the value of my dropdown in the way that you might expect, which is that I've got the scatter plot and it's basically uh, scatter plotting a subset of the data based on the year. So as I change the year dropdown, you can see that my, my chart is changing. So this is how you can use Dash to uh, wire together, you know, at least two components. Um, and uh, it's pretty pretty good time to introduce this little this little blue puck thing down here. Uh, so if I click here, I've got what's called the callback graph. And so here, it's showing you um, visually the structure of this application. So the structure of this application is fairly simple. I've got you know the the, the value of the year drives the the figure of the graph. Um, so that's always available if you have more more callbacks. And then here, you know, I haven't I haven't done anything silly yet, uh, but you've got a little error console. So here, you know, if I misspell year. And I re-execute. Um, oh, I've got this little this little red thing here, uh, and it's telling me in line here that that year is not defined. Um, so any errors that you might introduce into your app while coding in Python are available here in this kind of interactive uh, interactive. It's not a debugger yet, but it's an interactive error console. Um, so I just re-execute bring that up. So one more step uh, in my application. Let's kind of close the loop and make an interactive interactive graph. Um, two graphs, well, graph and a map. Um, so let's take a look at my callback graph here. You can see that uh, here, the year subsets both the graph and the map, but I'm, uh, there's a second callback here which says that the, the map is going to depend on the selected data from the graph. So how does that work? If I select some data here, you can see that the map down at the bottom is updated. So here I've selected some of the poorest countries in the world. Um, and you can sort of see geographically, geographically where they are. Here I'm selecting some of the richest countries in the world. You can see geographically where they are. How does this work? It's basically more of the same. I've got a drop down for the year. I've got a graph and I've got another graph. I say that the first graph depends on uh, the value of the year drop down. And then the second graph uh, depends on uh, the selection and the year. I see the question I'll answer you in just a sec. Um, and essentially, you know, the, the values of my callback here, I've got selected data, which means I can do a subset um, on the indices uh, that come back from, from the first chart. Uh, so the question is, how can we embed this into an existing website? That's a good question. Um, so 
a Dash application is actually an entire application. Uh, and so the way you would embed it, usually if you want it to be part of another web page, is via an iframe. Um, you can host the application um, somewhere like Heroku. It's a standard Python Flask application. Um, and you can either embed it uh, in an iframe or, as I'll show in a, in a minute, you can actually build your entire website in Dash uh, if, if you would like. Um, and then there are some slightly more complicated ways of embedding uh, that don't involve iframes, um, which generally uh, are part of uh, our commercial software, which I'll talk about uh, at the end of this talk. So that's kind of a flavor of uh, what you can do with Dash. Um, so this, I would say, is sort of like the minimal, the minimal thing which I would call a, an analytical application. So here I've got a control. OK, it's a drop down. It's maybe not the fanciest control, but it's there. And I've got a couple of charts. And one of them can update the other. Now, uh, I didn't have time to, to draw the, the, the full application, but we could make this bidirectional to do full cross filtering. So I do a selection over here, it updates this one, and then I can do a selection down here, and it would update this one. There's an example of that in the Dash documentation. But this is a pretty good stand in for an analytical application. Uh, it's essentially a web application. We tend to think of them as being quite data rich, quite uh, 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 graph or map uh, rich, map driven, chart driven. Uh, and it has you know, a mix of interactive controls and uh, visuals that you can interact with. So that's the end of the sort of live coding piece. Um, now I'm gonna show you sort of where you can go by remixing this, um, by adding you know, more elements to your layout and more complex callbacks. So some examples of Dash apps. I'm not gonna go through uh, all of them in detail, but uh, people are using Dash uh, all over the world in all sorts of domains. So, um, you know, we're seeing people uh, writing papers that are published in Nature to analyze uh, genomic data, um, and they are publishing alongside their journal article, they are publishing a Dash app. So this is the supporting website for a paper uh, that was published in Nature. Um, and you can see that there's a, there's a full Dash app here. Um, everything about this website is Dash. So here you've got single mode, batch mode, gene mode, and it essentially presented a way to do some kind of specialized data processing, and they packaged it up as a Dash app. They wrote a manual, the manual here with you know, the sidebar, all the charts here. This is all entirely written in Dash. Um, uh, so you know, we, we were very excited to see this kind of thing uh, out in the wild. Uh, this was built entirely without any help from us. Um, you can see that there are people using Dash uh, in the nonprofit sector. So this is basically um, a dashboard to understand a uh, data set that was opened up, I believe, in the UK. Um, so I don't know a lot about this data set, but it's essentially grants data. So uh, these developers have really kind of gone big with uh, the customization you can do with Dash. My alignment here is not so great. Um, you, you know, you've got some, some drop downs, you've got some sliders, uh, things are updating, and all of these graphs here are standard plotly figures. Uh, with you know additional additional drop downs to kind of drill through and present uh, this data set. Um, I see the question here. Uh, I'll I'll get to it uh, probably near the end. Um, another example uh, uh, from more of an engineering domain. This is one we kind of like. Uh, someone basically wanted to build a simulator for the positions of the legs of a little robot. Uh, and so here you've got some some little drop downs here. And as I'm as I'm interacting. That needs to wake up a little bit. I believe this is running on Heroku, so generally, uh, if, it, if it's been idle for a while, it needs to kind of give it a little think. Welcome back. Um, so uh, oh, here we go. It's back. All right. So as I uh, you know play with these little sliders here, I can kind of position the legs and uh, and offset um of the the different uh, nodes and edges here of this little robot and this person's really done a great job with this app so you know, the right middle leg cannot reach it because the ground is blocking the path you've got all these little error messages um so you can really uh kind of let your imagination run wild with the kinds of controls and outputs you can you can make with dash apps a and people do um so this is the, the show and tell tag on our community forum. And you know, multiple times a week, basically about once a day, people will come in and tell us about a Dash component they've built, a Dash app that they've built, um, that they're proud of. And so you know, giving talks like this is actually really easy because I just scan through the show and tell and find some nice apps to show people. Um, and then of course, there is a plotly maintained gallery of apps as well. So this is our app gallery. Um, all of the apps here, or sorry, uh, all the apps save two. 
are open source. So there's about 60 apps on this gallery, so sort of oil and gas data sets, object detection, financial reports, uh, big data rasterization, dashboards, drug discovery with 3D molecules, you know, uh, this sort of runs the gamut of applications and, and, and visual forms. Um, most of these apps, if you click on the little I here, um, it's got a little explanation of what the app does, and you can get access to the source code in either Python or R. And so the way most of our users uh, get going is they sort of find an app that looks a little bit like, like the one they want to build. Uh, they, they get the source code and they sort of adapt it. Um, and then they come tell us about it in the, in the show and tell on the forum. So this is all pretty exciting for us. Um, so I'll stop here and answer the question uh, that, that was asked here. So Tama, how would you compare Plotly Dash and let's say uh, JS and D3? And what situation is one better than the other? Um, so certainly uh, one of the situations in which Plotly and Dash uh, are a little bit better than, than JS and D3 is if you don't want to write any JavaScript. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that's one area where, where Plotly and Dash really shines. Um, uh, a sort of a more serious answer is that so Plotly Express, the rendering engine for Plotly Express is actually built on top of D3. So when you're using Plotly, you are using D3 uh, in many cases. Um, and it's basically a control versus speed trade-off. So if you want very, very fine control over every aspect of your visualization, um, you, there are limitations to what you can express within Plotly Express that may force you to either go one, le one level lower in our, uh, in our library to use uh, the Plotly.py graph objects, or uh, if they're the Python and um, the structure of the way Plotly.js sort of views the world is a little restrictive, you may in fact uh, be better off building an application from scratch in, in uh, JavaScript or D3. Um, so you are, you are getting a lot for free with Plotly and Plotly Express, but there are situations where you might need to uh, write your own, <clears throat> your own D3 code. Um, that, I would say, is sort of a comparison between D3 and, and Plotly, Plotly Express at the visualization layer. Um, with respect to Dash, you, know, you can write, essentially most of these applications, you could probably write in pure D3 if you felt like it. It might take longer. Uh, you would have access to fewer of the tools that are available in Python. So for example, a lot of the math to do the physical positioning of this thing here is just a, an open source Python library. Um, if you had to do this in D3 and you wanted to use the Python library, you'd have to write a microservice with some endpoints and manage the, the front end, phone in the back end, asking for, for pieces of data. This is all doable. We call this sort of full stack development, but uh, sometimes it's a little, little laborious uh, and you're willing to, to hand over a little bit of the control uh, in order to, to make things a lot easier for yourself. One final sort of asterisk is that um, here, you know, the application is composed of components um, and I'm just importing the, the default components, HTML and core components that gives me access to dropdowns and headers and uh, HTML tags. You can write your own components. So if you have a visualization library that's not Plotly that you really like, or if you have just one specific visualization that you really like, you can bake it in to a Dash application, just like a Plotly graph. Um, and so people do this, you know, actually today the, 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 top, uh, <clears throat> the top entry in, in uh, the Dash form show and tell is Dash leaflet. So someone decided that they wanted to do, uh, they wanted to wrap leaflet, which is a JavaScript uh, mapping library, instead of Plotly.js's mapping capabilities, and they built Dash leaflet. Pretty easy. Um, so it's, it's not really an either or type situation. It's sort of like pick the kind of code you'd like to write in a language you'd like to write it um, and, and then go ahead. So if you want to write some viz in, in D3, that's fine. How does it scale to a data set with thousands of millions of lines? Um, good question. So I would say here, um, the fact that you've got uh, Python in the loop allows you to scale to thousands, millions, billions of lines because you can do pre-aggregation in Python and send just the subset of the data that you'd like to send uh, to the front end. So we have an example of that, I believe, in our gallery. Um, let's see here. World Cell Towers. So here, this is a Dash app that was built to show uh, Dash's integration with a Python library called Dask. I'll give it a second here. So I've got 41 million data, data points here, um, and I can zoom into this map. Uh, and as I zoom, it's going to start filtering in the background on, on the Python level. So within the bounds of my map here, I've only got 29 million, only got 29 million data, data points. Um, and as I zoom a little bit, you can see that the, the resolution increases, and it's able to kind of re-aggregate uh, interactively as I zoom. And I believe actually that if I zoom far enough, 
um, there's a heuristic inside that will switch it over to uh, an actual scatter point. Scatter plot. We've got a few left points. So here now, uh, I've zoomed far enough, and each of these uh, each of these points is individually hovering. So here, uh, I'm using the power of Python and JavaScript together to kind of, you know, each piece is doing what it's good at. <laughs> uh, JavaScript is providing me with the sort of like rich interaction in the browser, and Python is, is doing a lot of them. Uh, still space open for questions, but I just got sort of one more, one more slide to go over. Um, usually when I give talks like this, um, People are very curious, you know, you've given us all this stuff for free. How do you guys make money at Botly? So at Botly, what we do is we sell something called Dash Enterprise. Uh, it's commercial enterprise software. Um, our sort of target market is uh, Fortune 5000 companies, so very large companies uh, or very profitable companies. And what it is that we sell are essentially a set of extensions to Dash. So the core promise of Dash and Botly is no JavaScript required. But as you've seen, you know, you have to write some HTML, perhaps, to lay out your app. You might have to do some CSS to get things looking just so. Um, uh, the question that was posed about uh, embedding into your, your existing website, you know, this is a Python app. It's got to run somewhere. Um, right now it's running on my laptop, but if I want to share this app with a colleague um, or with a customer, it's got to be hosted somewhere. So um, this app here is hosted on Heroku, which is a, a service that you can pay for. Um, Dash Enterprise provides, uh, provides this kind of hosting that you can install on your own servers. Um, and it, and it essentially makes it so that you can write Dash applications without having to write your own deployment system, without having to write your own styling system. So we've got a styling language that allows you to sort of rise above HTML and CSS and express things in terms of cards and components. Uh, scalability, you know, if you want to run applications that are up 24 seven and can handle millions of users, you're going to need to run them across multiple backends. Dash Enterprise handles that for you. Security, making sure only the right people can see the right apps. Automation, uh, running jobs on a schedule, producing PDF reports, uh, crunching uh, very large data sets, even bigger than the, the, the million row data sets. So these are all the features that we, uh, that we sell as part of Dash Enterprise, which is a closed source piece of software. But this is not a replacement for Dash. Uh, the Dash open source version is not, uh, it's not crippled in any way. It's the exact same version of Dash that runs inside Dash Enterprise. Dash Enterprise just contains a bunch of additional closed source components that you can use uh, with Dash. Um, and so the, the website for Dash Enterprise, if, if anyone's curious, is poly.com slash dash. Um, and um, the, web, sorry, the website for Dash itself is uh, dash.plotly.com. A little bit confusing, but there's a link from one to the other if you'd like. So that basically covers the, the prepared part of my talk. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions, go back to any demo. If people want to see Dash doing something, I've got 60 odd apps that I know fairly well that I can maybe find a, an example of. But thank you very much for listening.